Украине. Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight on this Tuesday, August 20th. Our union right now is trying to win a contract. Chicago Public School teachers return to the classrooms officially next week. They'll be working without a contract. We have the latest on negotiations. Lead levels in Flint and Newark have made national news. What does it mean for Chicago's water? Before you can really serve people, you ought to know a little bit about the cultures of the city and, and, and understand different things about people. And an empathy workshop works to help strengthen the relationship between police officers and the communities they'll patrol. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Paris Schutz. Here's some of what's making news in Chicago tonight. A long-awaited report on sexual harassment in the Illinois House has Speaker Michael Madigan on the hot seat. The report was commissioned by the state and produced by former State Executive Inspector General Maggie Hickey. It outlines a culture of fear, intimidation, and bullying under Speaker Madigan's fired former Chief of Staff, Tim Mapes. The report says that, quote, Mapes commonly threatened people's jobs or reminded them that they were dispensable. People believe that Mr. Mapes attempted to motivate workers through fear and that a few other supervisors throughout the years emulated this practice. The report says that women experienced inappropriate sexual behavior and did not feel they could safely come forward because of the atmosphere created by Mapes. However, the report could not substantiate specific allegations of retaliation made by State Representative Kelly Cassie, nor could could it substantiate sexual harassment allegations made against former state representative Lou Lang. Madigan says he's made changes and vows to do more. Quote, I take responsibility for not doing enough previously to prevent issues in my office and continue to believe that we collectively need to do more in the Capitol to improve our workplace culture and protect the men and women who work here who want to make a difference. Meanwhile, Mr. Mapes issued his own response saying in part, quote, it is my position that the recent criticisms made against me do not truly appreciate the size of the responsibility of my position. It goes on to say, quote, if my demeanor or approach to my job did not instill trust in a healthy work environment, I apologize. More trouble for shuttered Willowbrook company Sterigenics. 32 new lawsuits have been filed against the company over the release of carcinogenic chemical ethylene oxide into the air. The new lawsuits join 11 others that have already been filed. They allege the victims have been sickened by exposure to the chemical and that Sterigenics knew about the dangers of releasing it for decades. The state ordered the plant to shut down but reached an agreement that would allow it to reopen with new equipment to control the emission of ethylene oxide. As for the weather, partly cloudy tonight with a low around 71 and then tomorrow a chance of rain in the early afternoon, otherwise mostly cloudy and a high near 84. Chicago Public School teachers are officially back in the classroom next week, almost a week before students return. So far, they still have no contract deal with the Board of Education and have repeatedly threatened to walk off the job. And another controversy is brewing within the ranks that we first told you about here on Chicago Tonight last week. Brandis Friedman is following all of these things. And Brandis, what is the latest with this contract situation? So right now, a lot of back and forth between both sides, Paris, and it, little actual movement, it seems. So this afternoon, the union gave 
gave its members an update on where they are, holding an all-member meeting at its headquarters. The union has repeated that they want the Board of Education to put in writing in the contract the promises it's making to reduce class sizes and add staff counselors, nurses, and librarians, among other CTE requests. Mayor Lightfoot, though, has repeatedly said that she will include those promises in this current and future budgets, not the contract. And unfortunately, we can report that we have not seen those promises actually show up in the budget documents. Um, what we are seeing are what looks like allocation decisions, which will actually cut staffing in critical areas. We believe that we're seeing budget numbers which show a reduction in critical staffing areas like bilingual education and social workers and other critical frontline staff um, and even in special education workers. CTU President Jesse Sharkey there speaking just before union members head into a CPS budget hearing that happened this afternoon and this evening. They were there to testify against the budget proposal. Now, there are several steps that are to be taken before we can get serious about the S word strike. But I spoke with several CTU members today and some of them say they are strike ready. You know, we want to teach. We're teachers. We want to teach. We want children in front of us. We want joyful learning, but we are preparing to do whatever it takes to get the conditions those students deserve. This is a fight for like everything this community, this city is undergoing, right? When it comes to rapid gentrification changes, the trauma our children are going with, when it comes to unemployment, these things are matter. And these are things that are definitely worth striking for. I'm 100% in for it. If it boils down to it, then that's what we got to do for the city to understand we're serious. I mean, we're educators, we're professionals, you know, and sometimes it feels as though we're not being treated that, that way. And that last member that you heard from there, Paris, she says that um, she agrees with the leadership on the terms of these contracts. You know, despite being she's one of the candidates who ran on the members first caucus who challenged Jesse, Shark Jesse Sharkey and uh, the core caucus in this last CTU election in All May. Right. So it's clear uh, what CTU thinks about the negotiations. What about CPS? So while CTU is blaming the district for dragging its feet on negotiations, uh, the district is saying the same about the union, saying that a couple of the CTU members of leadership took uh, rather long vacations this month and that stalled negotiations. They're also saying they haven't responded to a number of proposals that the city, the board, has sent CTU. Those proposals are on staffing, substitute teachers, teacher evaluations, um, and a few other subjects. Now that said, a source who's very familiar with the negotiations tells me that the city feels confident that they can get a deal worked out without a strike. Prince, last week you had Jesse Sharkey here on the show. You asked him about a controversial trip that some of his members took to Venezuela to meet with the president there, Nicolas Maduro. Remind us what's going on here. Well, and they didn't necessarily meet with the president there, but they were supposed to meet with the education minister in, uh, in Venezuela. And that was in July. Several uh, CTU members took that trip, uh, several educators calling themselves, you know, a CTU delegation. Now, Jesse Sharkey, as you mentioned, Paris, he uh, last week told us that that was not an official CTU trip, wasn't funded by CTU, uh, and that members take trips like this all the time. Actually, they've gone to Honduras, Palestine, and Chile. But after this trip, several members who operate what's called the Radical Educator Collective blog online, they blogged in support of Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro, under whose rule the country is in a humanitarian crisis with millions fleeing in search of asylum. Maduro himself is also accused of human rights violations. But many CTU members take issue with the group not only traveling to the country under the CTU name, but praising President Maduro on their blog. What these delegates are saying is not true and it's unfortunately because it's unethical and it's unprofessional and it really doesn't represent everybody in our union. Now, additionally, the Illinois Venezuelan Alliance that was founded two years ago in response to the massive number of Venezuelan immigrants coming to the area, they sent a letter to CTU President Jesse Sharkey rejecting a resolution that the union passed back in March as well as the trip itself. The letter also expressed concern at how that delegation got the visas to get into the country and believes that they were only shown the parts of the country that the government wanted them to see in order to spread its propaganda. Now, we have tried to reach out to the teachers who run that blog. We haven't heard back from them yet, Paris. Brandis, how is the Chicago Chicago Teachers Union responding to all this criticism. So we asked Jesse Sharkey about this again this afternoon. He says, you know, with a 25,000 member organization, they are going to have diverse opinions, but they are also very proud of their union. And so they may represent the union doing different activities. He says he's got no interest in policing what every single member says when they do that. Uh, he says more than that, though, what's more important is that the union members should focus on unity uh, and being unified when they have to negotiate this critical contract. Speaking of the contract, negotiators are back at the bargaining 
table uh, twice this week and again next week. Sharkey says he is pleased, though, at the pacing of negotiations. He believes it's picked up. And again, even without a contract, teachers are going to go back to work next week. Teachers go back to work next week. Absolutely. It's just going to take a little bit more time to hammer out the strike. It's a bit more time before they can even vote on a strike. So they're going to work next week. Brandis, thank you very much. And up next, the efforts to remove lead from Chicago's water. So stay with us. This evening's presentation of Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by ComEd, powering lives. We have a tremendous source of untapped efficient energy right here in our school. Let her rip, Jenny. I kind of love this idea. <laughs> the ComEd Energy Efficiency Program has real ideas for making schools energy efficient. Pedal faster. <laughs> Newark, New Jersey is the latest city to experience a water crisis. A recent report out of the Environmental Protection Agency found dangerously high lead levels in some of that city's water supply. Chicago, like Newark, has lead service lines and has had issues of its own in recent years. They prompted Mayor Lori Lightfoot to halt the city's water meter installation program for fears that that could be upping lead levels in water. So just how safe is Chicago's water at this moment? Joining us to discuss all of this and more are Dr. Allison Arwady, Chief Medical Officer and Acting Commissioner of the Chicago Department of Public Health. Andrea Putz, Deputy Commissioner of Water Supply for the Chicago Department of Water Management. And Jen Walling, Executive Director of the Illinois Environmental Council. Glad to have all of you here. Uh, Dr. Arwady, how similar is Chicago's situation to what is happening in Newark right now? Yeah, it's not similar. Uh, the situation in Newark was really triggered by the fact that in Newark there were levels of lead found in the water that exceeded the levels that we need to stay below according to the Environmental Protection Agency. In Chicago, we continue to meet and exceed all of those federal guidelines. And uh, uh, Andrea puts there, there's been different studies. There's the EPA that studies this. How many homes in Chicago uh, are experiencing elevated lead levels in their water? Well, we haven't sampled everyone's homes, of course. So um, we actually have encouraged people to get a free lead testing kit through 311, and we also have research programs. Um, in general, we see about a 5% um, of those homes that are tested through our volunteer program that are high. And uh, Jen Walling, uh, re remind us what an elevated lead level means. Well. An elevated lead level is any level of lead. Um, the CDC says there's no safe level of lead um, for children. But when you look at the federal law, um, 15 parts per billion is the action level. And that's the level over which if you have 90% um, of the samples over that, then you're going to have the federal action level. But we would argue that the level that's safe for water, for paint, for soil um, is zero. We want no lead in um, the items that our, uh, our children interact with. And, and the EPA does come in and does this study. The city regularly, routinely passes the study, but there's a lot of criticism of, of that EPA study, is there not? Mm -hmm. And so, can you explain it? Um, well, I think um, one of the items that we talked about here is the uh, the testing that happens in the city of Chicago. And I think there's been some concern over the way the city of Chicago has tested in meeting that lead and copper rule. Um, and so testing that has happened in fewer locations or on the outskirts of the city and not really in areas that we might see concern. Obviously, the city has stepped up and you can get a free lead testing kit calling through and one. Um, so lots of people have requested that, um, but there are concerns over the way uh, the city is. And Dr. Arwady, we mentioned that Mayor Lightfoot has halted the installation of water meters. Can you tell us why the mayor felt the need to do that? Sure. Um, so as always, we're putting the safety and the health of Chicago citizens and especially Chicago's children first. In this case, there was a large uh, study that the city of Chicago actually commissioned to help understand whether this was a, a risk factor. Um, we were really proactive to say, is there something that that we should be doing here? Is there an issue? And so um, hundreds of homes were sampled as part of this study. And in about 7%, 7.1% of the homes, uh, the homes did go above that federal 
federal action level for lead in water. And so although they didn't go above it, there, there was no change or it didn't get to that level in more than 92% of the homes, still the feeling was for a program where we are proactively putting in a water meter, um, it was a better decision to halt that until we could understand why that was being so caused or make sure. 7% of homes having elevated levels, that was concerning study, enough. Right. Um, uh, Andrea puts, um, we, we should remind viewers, we're talking, there's, there's the main that goes down the main street and then there's the service line that goes from the main to each property. How many properties in the city have these lead service lines? Well, we estimate that it's about 390,000. Um, it's gonna be mostly your single family and two flats. Your larger buildings will tend to not have lead service lines, multi-unit residences. And Jen Walling, is there any solution here that's safe short of replacing all lead service lines? Well, that is the safe solution to us, is replacing all lead solution. service lines. It, it's an expensive solution, but not replacing lead service lines is expensive as well, especially when it comes to our educational and criminal justice systems. Um, so there are measures in place that will bring the lead down, detectable levels of lead down to zero. Those are items like flushing, or we'll talk about um, total lead filters, and uh, Andrea can go a little more into exactly what those are. But there's still always risk when we're going to have lead service lines in. We've seen it in Newark, we've seen it in University Park with the solder, um, we've seen it in Galesburg, Illinois. There's still going to be risk, and those lead service lines need to come out, and we need to recognize that, that truth and figure out a plan to do it. Dr. Arwady, where does the administration at this point stand on what should be done with these nearly 393,000 lead lines? Yeah, so it's a big question. Um, and in fact, there has been a report commission to look at how this should be addressed. How has it been addressed? How has it been paid for in other cities? I do wanna just add though that at the Chicago Department of Public Health, we get every blood lead test that is done in the city of Chicago for children, for adults, and the whole city you know, has the same water system. We see a reasonable distribution. There's not different neighborhoods that have different risk factors. Not really. We see these, these, it's where you have the single flats and the two family homes. If, you know, if the home was built. The older homes. The older homes. If it's, if it's 1986 or prior, it likely has a lead service line. But we see really where we see kids getting lead poisoned, it is still predominantly driven when children are exposed to lead based paint. Um, so we it's talk about water, line. but it's, but it's when, when we look at the difference, there are neighborhoods in Chicago where we see much more lead poisoning and that's where the homes um, may not be in as good repair. And to be clear, it's that homes built before 1986 because the, the US EPA outlawed uh, lead pipes in construction after after 86, so, so that's why that's right. that cutoff exists. The lead paint in 1978, in 19 and so any home older than 1978 likely has lead-based paint. When that's chipping, especially young children will put those chips in their mouths, and that yeah. is how we see children largely getting lead poisoning. Andrea puts, we've talked about how the city will provide testing kits and water filters. You brought uh, yeah. some of that stuff with you to, to show us how it works. So show us how the uh, testing kit works. Yes. Well, that's the oh, filter that's the right filter there. Kit. I'll, I'll do the filter kit first and then I'll do the testing kit. The filter is just, you know, so everyone knows that we're offering these free filters and um, it, they come as this pitcher with a filter inside. Mm -hmm. uh, we also provide six of these filter cartridges as replacements. Um, we encourage people to flush. We provide these filter guidance cards. We have them flush for five minutes before they fill this up. And in case you're wondering if your filter is still working, it's included um, this TDS meter. TDS is total dissolved solids, but it's basically, basically measuring metals and minerals. It's checking to make sure that your filter is still working. Now, is this 100% foolproof? I mean, does this filter remove all potential lead in water? It uh, is up to 99% for up to 150 parts per billion of lead. So for what Chicago experiences, it's pretty foolproof is, and it's pretty simple to use too. Just, uh, Jen Walling, there's some problems happening in Will County now uh, with respect to lead in water. Can you just fill us in on those? So uh, University Park in Will County is experiencing extremely high and hazardous levels of lead. Um, Aqua Illinois is their service provider. They're different in having a, a private water company that is providing their water. They switched from um, groundwater to a surface water and um, their issues, we talked about the lead service line, their issues actually have to do with solder and some of the indoor plumbing, um, which is less likely in, well, it's a factor in the city of Chicago, but um, a smaller factor. And so they're seeing very high levels of lead. Um, they're being provided water by Aqua Illinois. There's some concern over um, how quickly Aqua reacted to it and they are being sued by the Attorney General's office. We're really pleased about that suit that it's moving forward. Um, but any community that might be switching from ground to surface water um, should 
look at this issue of concern. So that's a di different uh, situation there mm -hmm. than in Chicago. And as I understand, there is potential legislation in the state house that would replace all lead service lines in Illinois. Can you tell us about that? Yes, we've been working with State Senator Heather Staines for several years on uh, legislation having to do with lead. She passed a bill about lead testing in schools and child care centers, which every school and child care center in Illinois has to be tested. Um, and we're working now towards something that requires an inventory and a full replacement plan for lead. Um, and there's a lot of support, but uh, the city of Chicago in the past has been an opponent to that bill. All right. Well, we're out of time. So my thanks to Dr. Allison Arwadi, Andrea Putz, Jen Walling. Thank you very much for sharing these very important insights with us. And you can visit our website for more information on how to get your free water test kit and filter. Chicago Police Department recruits put their acting skills to the test this afternoon in an empathy workshop hosted by Story Catchers Theater. Arts correspondent Angel Edo shares how this role play workshop is taking a new approach to improving the relationship between first responders and the communities they patrol. In its third year, Story Catchers Theater is taking a unique approach to help youth in and out of the criminal justice system cope with their trauma. Over 90% of crime is committed due to unresolved trauma. Um, so when we work with them, we use the process of art for them to heal and understand their actions and consequences and to be able to deal with their trauma. I'm hurt, I'm angry, it's so bitter cold. The participants ages 17 to 24 write out their life-changing experiences. They then work with artistic directors to determine how their stories can be turned into dialogue with an overall message. A stage manager of Story Catchers Theater says this coping method is imperative. We've had a story where someone's father was killed and you know that particular you know emotion is just you can't hide it so you know being able to relate to that and then having the CV ensemble be able to be there for you and support you and let you know that you know everything is okay that the reason you told your story is to get it out there so that you can better cope with it because sometimes just telling your story helps you cope. The thespians then take their stories to the stage for an empathy workshop. Held monthly, more than 2,000 CPD recruits have already participated. Today, they reenacted a traffic stop from both the young person's perspective and from the recruit's perspective. We're all people. That's one thing both CPD and story catchers say they're able to take away from this empathy workshop. The more difficult aspect is uh, identifying some of these much more subtle aspects of, of racism in our society, or not just racism, differences between the different uh, communities that we have to be sensitive to in law enforcement, as law enforcement officers in our profession. It's really important for us to recognize when to utilize our power and then when we have maybe other types of power available to us that are more appropriate. So we need to look at individuals on the street not just as offenders, but as people. Being a black woman from the city of Chicago, I wanted to be able to help my community members. I wanted to be able to connect to people in ways that an officer that might not look, for, look like them, they might be put off by that right away. So looking like someone that's already a revenue and then showing them like, I, I am in this uniform, but this uniform doesn't depict how I'm gonna be as a person. Because it's not always about hate. A lot of times it's about fear and fear comes from lack of knowledge. So just keeping that dialogue open and allowing people to be educated on things that they might not be used to. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. Story Catchers Theater will be receiving a $10,000 grant in October by Bright Promises Foundation to continue their work as they tour in schools, churches, and conventions. And that is our show for this Tuesday night, abbreviated to bring you special pledge programming. Please join us tomorrow night, live at 7. Cook County Public Defender Amy Campanelli is here to talk about her opposition to a new gun offender database. And we visit the Illinois Raptor Center, where sick, injured, or orphaned birds of prey are taken to be rehabilitated. We leave you with some fine feathered friends who stopped in front of our studios for a little while for some TV time. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.
Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, serving Chicago as a personal injury law firm since 1984.